Growing up in the 90s, even those kids horror shows like Are You Afraid of the Dark and Goosebumps used to keep me up at night. Despite that, I have had a long time fascination with the horror genre. For me, the highlight of going to Blockbuster as a kid was walking through the horror aisle and reading all the plot summaries on the backs of those VHS boxes. Of course, I never worked up the nerve to rent any of them, but that never stopped me from coming back again and again. Now I'm an adult, and an adult that has made peace with her own queerness at that. I've since gone back and watched many of those same movies that I was too scared to rent as a kid. In doing so, I have learned a fundamental truth of the horror genre. Horror is really, really gay. Queerness is foundational to horror. And if you don't believe me, take perhaps the most important work in the development of the modern horror genre, Dracula. Bram Stoker was himself a closeted gay man, and some scholars believe that he counted both Oscar Wilde and Walt Whitman among his lovers. Knowing that about the story's author adds another level to the work, in some ways transforming it into a doomed love story. Just consider Dracula's lines in this scene where he's protecting his guest from the vampire women. How dare you touch him, any of you? How dare you cast eyes on him when I had forbidden it? Back, I tell you all. This man belongs to me. Beware how you meddle with him, or you will have to deal with me." And you can trace the connection between queerness and the horror genre back even further than Dracula. The Irish vampire novella Carmilla predates Stoker's writing and remains a fixture of both lesbian and horror literature well into the present day. It's even inspired film adaptions like The Vampire Lovers and the extremely excellent Dracula's Daughter. Carmilla has also been cited as the first piece of published British fiction depicting a lesbian. And I can go on. For example, have you ever considered how Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is a story about two men trying to conceive a child? Shelley herself was also bisexual, writing in a letter that she was apt to get tousy mousy with other women after the death of her husband. Horror as a genre is, was, and probably always will be really, really gay. However, things have changed quite a bit since Stoker and Shelley. Horror is a genre that is heavily defined by historical context. Case in point, The Raven just isn't very scary in the year of our Lord and Savior Luigi Mario 2023. You can tell a lot about any particular junction in history by looking at what scared people at the time. Films like Night of the Living Dead and the remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers speak to the Cold War anxieties of their time. The mall setting of Romero's 1978 Dawn of the Dead speaks to his own thoughts and feelings about the rising tide of consumerism as the 70s turned into the 80s. In what better way to mark the beginning of the 1980s than the political rise of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, the latter of which famously quoted saying that there is no such thing as a society, there is only people and there are families. Correspondingly, the 1980s were also marked by the rise in popularity of slasher films and home invasion films. In these movies, the threat is personal and individual unlike a faceless mob of zombies that didn't seem to resonate with the cultural and political moment of the early 1980s. And of everything that I've mentioned in this video so far and everything I'm going to talk about after this, Reagan and Thatcher are far and away the most evil. The 1980s gave us franchises like Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th, but it also gave us a name for a subgenre that had been part of horror from the early gothic literature days all the way into the present. And that's body horror. You can go back even further than those early gothic days and find the roots of body horror in the work of 18th century philosophers like Nietzsche and Schopenhauer. They saw the body as the sum of all human experience. Even if we do have minds, they're still in the brain. They are still part of the body, and so our physical experience is the sum of who we are. Unsurprisingly, our bodies can also be the source of a lot of anxieties. After all, they are fragile, finite, and not entirely under our control. Body horror pulls from those anxieties that come from having a body and blows them up to extreme proportions. If that sounds like a really broad category to you, well, you're right. Kafka's metamorphosis could be considered body horror. Zombies are body horror. Robocop is body horror. Freaky Friday is body horror, and if you're like me, you might have already thought of one other thing. Puberty can also be body horror. 
The connecting thread that runs through all of these works is that the narratives follow along as a person's body changes in a way that makes them uncomfortable in their own skin. And that feeling of discomfort, that alienation from your body, is something that some queer people feel in their day-to-day -day lives. These stories take the everyday horror of body dysmorphia and gender dysphoria and blows them up to these extreme proportions that can make the individual experience seem tame by comparison. Or maybe even normalize them by allowing the viewer to feel like they're not alone in their own experience. And I am not the first person to come up with this connection. If you go and do a quick search, you will find a number of excellent video essays and articles written by other queer creatives, some of which actually own that they don't enjoy the horror genre, but see their struggles reflected in movies like Videodrome, Nightbreed, and Alien. For them, body horror might be the only form of media that thinks about bodies as much as they do. That connection is not lost on the creators of these films either. Modern master of the genre and fellow Canadian icon David Cronenberg is a gushing supporter of transgender people. When asked if he was aware of the transgender movement during an interview, Cronenberg said, quote, Yeah, well, I observe it. I'm not really engaged with it directly. They're taking that idea seriously. They're saying body is reality. I want to change my body. And they're being very brave and in investing a lot in these changes, especially the ones that are not reversible, which most of them aren't. I say go ahead. This is an artist giving their all to their art, end the quote. His latest film, Crimes of the Future, takes place in a world where human evolution has begun to accelerate. In the face of rapid biological changes bringing into question what it means to be human, the government attempts to restrict human evolution. Meanwhile, others embrace or even try to accelerate those changes. It takes almost no effort to see the parallels between the movie's plot and the transgender experience. This is a story about bodily autonomy in the face of an oppressive government. With the way that things are going in America at the moment, a story like this with a government trying to restrict what people can and cannot do with their own bodies would seem on the nose, had it not been for Cronenberg having written it back in 2003. Even though you can have a gendered reading of a movie like Crimes of the Future, the connection is still only allegorical. It's an interpretation that is welcomed, but not necessarily intended. There are some other works in the recent body hoarder catalog like Titan and Possessor which deal with the topic of gender more directly in their actual story. But being more direct doesn't necessarily mean that it's a central part of the narrative. It's still only a secondary consideration. Titan star Agatha Roussel has said of her character, quote, It has nothing to do with trans identity. I've seen lots of people talking about that. She turns into this guy not out of an identity crisis, but out of survival, end quote. In fact, it is surprisingly rare to see gender used as a vehicle for body horror, especially so when you consider how the visual language of film centers on things like the shape of a person's face and their mannerisms, which are such heavily gendered parts of having a body. And this is where I want to bring up the topic of manga artist Shuzo Oshimi. If you're familiar with his works, this might seem like a strange pivot. After all, his most notable work like Blood on the Tracks and The Flowers of Evil or Akunohana aren't even in the horror genre. He's best known for small-scale, introspective stories that explore the bleak mundanity of modern life, social stigma, and the fuzzy line between the end of adolescence and the beginning of adulthood. As a writer, he has an incredible gift for taking the same kinds of shameful thoughts that someone might write down in a diary and lock away in a drawer and building them up into haunting, relatable, and messy narratives. There are times where reading his work feels voyeuristic, almost like you're listening in on someone else's therapy session. His work also tends to deal fairly explicitly with sex and sexuality, but they're the kind of stories that do seem to find certain people at a certain time and stick with them for years afterwards. Oshimi's Inside Mari ran from 2012 to 2016. Like in his other works, Oshimi pulled from his own lived experience while working on the piece. It's in the author's notes at the end of the first volume where Oshimi directly addresses one of the main inspirations for the work. Quote, I want to be born as a girl, be brought up as a girl, live my life as a girl, just be a genuine girl, end quote. Neither the work or the author claim to have any kind of trans perspective. 
But the work still comes from a deeply personal gender conflict stemming from the question, how much of who I am is based on my past and how much of it is based on how other people treat me? If things had gone differently for me, would I still end up being the same person? Is it even really possible for me to be someone else? The narrative of Inside Mari begins with Isao Komori, a college dropout that lives in almost total seclusion, with the exception of his run-ins with a high school girl named Mari at a local convenience store. Even though he's never spoken to her, in Komori's eyes, Mari is beautiful, pure, even ethereal. In his inner monologue, he refers to her as a convenience store angel. And one day, Komori awakens to find himself in Mari's body. However, when he goes to investigate, he finds that he is still in his old body. So then, who is this Komori that's inside of Mari's body? And where did Mari go? The story starts with the familiar Freaky Friday body swap scenario, where everybody is going to learn important lessons about empathy and then go back to their own bodies. But Oshimi manages to use your potential familiarity with the subject to subvert your expectations and take this premise in a very different direction. Whereas another story might play the situation for comedy, Oshimi digs deep into the realism of the story's magical realism. Komori is an unpopular and emasculated man now trying to live the life of a woman that he knows almost nothing about. His attempts to be Mari, or at least to try to be the person that the people in her life expect her to be, end in disaster all the while trying to navigate the horrors of having a heavily gendered body. Being a girl doesn't come naturally to anyone. It is a skill that is trained over time and takes a tremendous amount of effort. So whether it's knowing how to dress or trying to navigate the complex intricacies of Mari's relationships with her classmates, Komori is doomed to fail over and over again. How a person eats, how a person sits, even how a person inflects certain words are all heavily gendered behaviors. But by using the body swap premise, Oshimi is able to peel back a layer in the narrative and then explore the anxieties that stem from the performance of gender. Apart from Mari's relationships with her friends, classmates, and family, all the things that are going on outside of Mari, Oshimi also explores the physicality of the situation through Komori's alienation from his new body. He always refers to it as Mari's body, seeing himself not even as a guest, but as an intruder. He even goes as far as to cover his eyes when showering and changing to preserve his own impression of Mari. Regardless of how he feels about it though, Komori is unable to avoid the reality of having a body. In one scene, he doubles over in pain while experiencing menstrual cramps for the first time. At first, both Komori and the reader don't understand what is happening, which transforms a potentially mundane bodily process into the stuff of horror. As the narrative goes on, Komori gradually becomes more comfortable with femininity as he improves at playing the role of Mari. At the start of the narrative, he needs help with things like fashion and makeup, but is later shown doing those same things effortlessly. It's not until the final chapters of the story that Oshimi plays his final card. There never was a body swap here. The narrative up until this point has been a dissociative episode brought on by a combination of Mari's own repressed trauma, ongoing tensions with her mother, and a developing awareness that she is seemingly romantically and sexually attracted to other women. While Komori might have been admiring Mari from afar, she had been following him as well. She felt trapped in her position in life and saw Komori's departure from society as a potential escape from her own situation ultimately believing that she had become him as a way of escaping from the stress of her day-to-day -day life. It's not a surprise that one of the top searched questions relating both to Oshimi as an author and this work in particular is, is Inside Mari a work of horror? Yeah, parts of the narrative are horrifying, but the story doesn't tread too deeply into established genre fare. By the end of the story, it's completely thrown away all the magical realism that was present at the start. There is something about the story that feels simultaneously very familiar and alien at the same time. As a reader, parts of it are disorienting and uncomfortable to read, but is it necessarily a work of horror? I would say absolutely yes. This work leans expertly into all of the kinds of nitty gritty anxieties that come from having a body and all of the gender that comes along with it. This is the kind of thing that people mean when they're talking about elevated horror. 
The themes of gender and identity that are present in Inside Mari are further developed in Oshimi's currently ongoing Welcome Back Alice. The story focuses on three childhood friends that are separated when one of them moves away only to all reunite back in high school. In the three years that they've been separated, the returning friend Kay has adopted a decidedly non-binary gender identity and now presents as a feminine beauty that is unrecognizable to the people that knew them before. When they introduce themselves to the class, they say that they have given up on being a man, but they also don't claim to be a woman. Kay's reappearance complicates the existing love triangle between the three friends, while also challenging the series protagonist Yohei's own sexuality and gender identity. In the episode of the interview series Urasawa Naoki no Manben Nio, focusing on Oshimi, he lays out his perspective on masculinity and manhood and how it brought him to work on Welcome Back Alice. To paraphrase the translation, I sometimes say that it's very painful to be a man. I have a feeling that it would be nice if I could become a girl, just wholly from the inside. I had a strong desire for that, but now I've started to think, is that actually what it is? Maybe it's something more than that, like wanting to quit being a man. There are ideas that subconsciously exist inside you, like it has to be this way, or you have to put up with this because you're a boy, or you have to do things a certain way. I felt like those ideas were coming from inside of me, and I wanted to figure out what that is. The perils of masculinity and manhood are the central conflict for Welcome Back Alice. For our protagonist, the expectations that other people put on him as a man frame his relationships both with his own body and also with the other characters. He slides along on invisible rails, feeling more miserable as he accomplishes things that he's told that he wants, like getting a girlfriend and having sex. The more of a man that he becomes, the more alienated from his own body he feels. All the while, Kay's re-entry into his life has made him aware of his own relationship with masculinity, as well as the possibility that there may be another way that he could live. The story is still ongoing, but it has quickly become my favorite of Oshimi's works. I really think that this work in particular has the potential to be a masterpiece. Both Welcome Back Alice and Inside Mari deal with the topic of bodies from similar but different angles. Much of how our lives turn out can be framed by what a doctor decided after looking at your junk when you were born. In some of these cases, gender becomes a trap and a source of pain. An invisible track leading someone to despair. Nestled within the conversation about gender and body horror is the representation of transness in horror. And it's horrifying, but not in a good way. From Psycho, to Silence of the Lambs, to Sleepaway Camp, to Insidious, there is a long-held and troubling connection between transness, or at least what the writers depict as transness, and mental instability. Some more recent films have depicted explicitly trans characters more positively, but those characters are typically shown having completed their transitions. The messy reality of transitioning is rarely if ever shown. For trans people, the process of transition, whether medical or social, is liberating. There is beauty and power in becoming the sculptor and the marble as you work toward creating a more realized sense of self. But it is also a messy and uncertain process rife with anxiety that could be explored through the lens of body horror. The Skin I Live In is a 2011 thriller based on the French novel Miguel, localized in English as Tarantula. Both the film and novel follow Richard Lafagué as he takes revenge on a young man named Vincent for having a role in his daughter's suicide. But in both, Lafagué takes his revenge by surgically transforming Vincent into a woman. In both versions, Vincent struggles to maintain his sense of identity throughout the process, leading to two different endings. In the movie, he takes revenge on his captor, escapes, and returns to his family to face an uncertain future. In the novel, Vincent seemingly loses his sense of self and adopts a new identity. The second example is the decidedly less artistic 2016 film The Assignment, where professional killer Frank is kidnapped and subjected to gender reassignment surgery by a Dr. Rachel Jane. All of this is done out of revenge after Frank kills her brother. I'm not going to claim that this is a good movie. The assignment works best when it's actually leaning away from the action and into the gendered elements of the story. 
Unlike the skin I live in, at no point is Frank's gender ambiguous. He is a man. And the radical changes to his body do not change that. Because all of that happens early in the film, the plot allows the viewer to follow as Frank tries to reconcile those changes in his body. While recovering from surgery, Frank stays with an ex, and while their relationship seems to be moving back in a physical direction, Frank slams the brakes because he is now so disconnected from his body that he cannot move forward with a physical relationship. And then that's when something clicked for me. And that's when something clicked for me. I wasn't just watching a pretty average action movie, I was actually watching a fairly interesting movie about gender dysphoria. In a later scene, Frank meets with the doctor to talk about whether or not the surgery can be reversed. Unsurprisingly, the surgeon doesn't take Frank seriously, patronizing him and questioning his understanding of how he was able to get access to this surgery without knowing basic information about it. This scene in particular stuck out to me. Trans people often have to advocate for themselves to doctors. I mean, whom amongst us doesn't know way more about endocrinology today than they ever thought they would? In this scene, the film is pulling from the very real difficulty that trans people experience in not being believed or trusted by medical professionals, and then using that to disempower and create anxiety and tension. Frank is struggling, now living both with gender dysphoria as well as the complicated bureaucracy that goes along with transition. Earlier in this video, I talked about that affinity that some queer people feel for body horror, and it's through these two films that I really started to understand how that works. Both films show a surgical transition that is impossibly thorough, where the subject is indistinguishable from a cis woman. Tragically, in the real world, estrogen doesn't do anything for a person's voice, and removing facial hair, especially if you're blonde, is a long and painful process. It's not lost on me that these are not trans stories. They are transition stories that use the language of body horror to explore the limits of gender in the human body. In some ways, it feels like watching my own process in reverse. At the start of the story, the character is comfortable with themselves, and at the end, they are dealing with gender dysphoria. All the while, I'm looking at this result and thinking, damn, how can I get that doctor's number? Even though there are elements of these narratives that are horrifying, or at least are supposed to be horrifying, in some ways, I find it empowering. It's motivating to think about the possibility of the human body to change. It also makes me feel resilient, maybe even kind of badass, for all the things that I've gone through to be the person who I want to be. Horror has a fascinating power to make the exceptional seem mundane and the mundane seem exceptional. For all the queerness that's baked into the history of the genre, body horror might be where it's felt the strongest. And where one person might find discomfort in the body's ability to change, another person might see a beautiful possibility for a future for themselves. While writing this script, I learned that David Cronenberg actually dislikes the phrase body horror. To him, the body is the essential fact of the human condition and all that comes with it. Even in films like The Fly and The Thing, he sees beauty. To him, taking the image of the body to extremes is one way of using an artistic lens to explore what it means to be a person and to understand how it is that we might be able to better ourselves. Because at the end of the day, bodies are weird, gross, and wonderful things. And at the heart of all body horror is that idea that nothing ever has to be the way that it is. And what could be more queer than that? <sighs> And that's what I've got for this time. This is something that's been on my mind for quite a while. So there were actually a couple of different script ideas that ended up kind of coalescing here. Let me know in the comments and all that. And until next time, be nice to yourself. <laughs>